Bonsoir et bienvenue à l'ILARA, l'Institut des Longues Rares de l'École Pratique des Hautes Études, PSL. Hello and welcome to ILARA, our institute, whose aim it is to showcase the rare and precious ancient and contemporary languages of the world. Professor John Baines will speak in English, but let me introduce our institute in French first. L'ILARA est un institut créé en août 2020 par arrêté du ministère français de l'enseignement supérieur de la recherche et de l'innovation. Sa mission est de sensibiliser et former le grand public aux langues rares, anciennes et contemporaines et à leur culture. L'ILARA participe ainsi à la valorisation et la sauvegarde de ces langues à travers des actions de documentation. Deux offres principales sont actuellement disponibles pour tous les publics. D'une part, une offre de cours d'initiation, de découverte et d'approfondissement en présentiel à Paris et étant donné la situation en visioconférence. Vous y trouverez par exemple des initiations à l'émessal, variété du sumérien, ou aux langues kartvéliennes en Géorgie méridionale, ou au Mandchou Sibé en Mandchourie. Vous trouverez d'autre part une offre de vidéoconférence virtuelle, l'ILARA en ligne, disponible sur notre chaîne et dans la première série, les invitations de l'ILARA mettent à l'honneur des spécialistes de renommée internationale sous forme d'entretiens et de conférences. Dans ce cadre de l'ILARA en ligne, nous avons accueilli dès cet automne, par exemple, Marianne Mitroun, Scott Delancey, Bernard Connery ou Nick Evans, qui nous ont fait découvrir l'extraordinaire diversité des langues d'Amérique du Nord, de l'Asie, du Caucase ou de l'Asie, l'Australie, pardon, respectivement. Ou Stephen Houston et Theo Fandenhout pour les langues et écritures anciennes, Maya ou Tit, respectivement. Des tables rondes sur l'écologie du multilinguisme des langues rares, ainsi qu'un cycle de 15 conférences encore en cours portant sur les judéolangues, c'est-à-dire les langues ou dialectes intracommunautaires associés à une population juive spécifique, leur histoire et leur tradition littéraire. Toutes ces conférences sont encore en ligne pour ceux qui n'auraient pu les écouter. Nous avons aujourd'hui l'honneur et le très grand plaisir d'accueillir le professeur John Baines. John Baines est professeur émérite d'égyptologie à l'Université d'Oxford. Il a été professeur invité dans de nombreuses universités en Afrique, en Asie de l'Est, en Europe et en Amérique du Nord. Il est l'auteur notamment de « Visual and Written Culture in Ancient Egypt » 2007, « The High Culture and Experience in Ancient Egypt » 2013, et co-éditeur de « Historical Consciousness and the Uses of the Past in the Ancient World » 2019. John Baines a publié des articles portant sur le comparatisme entre civilisations anciennes dans des revues et dans des collections interdisciplinaires. Outre l'analyse comparative, ses principaux intérêts de recherche portent sur l'archéologie, l'art, l'écriture, la biographie, la religion et la société égyptienne ancienne. Par ceci, il a contribué de manière centrale à dépasser un certain structuralisme au profit d'approches interprétatives qui considèrent pleinement les acteurs anciens, leurs perceptions et perspectives et les espaces vécus de leurs actions. Il a introduit également des notions et questionnements anthropologiques dans une discipline qui n'était guère ouverte traditionnellement à ceci. Ainsi, la problématisation des notions de décorum, de haute culture, high culture, de performance, d'expérience, pour n'en citer que quelques-uns. Les travaux de John Baines se nourrissent souvent du dialogue avec des spécialistes d'autres cultures, renouvelant ainsi les perspectives sur l'Égypte et rendant l'Égypte intelligible à d'autres. Je ne citerai que deux exemples. Sur les questions de pouvoir, d'élite et de haute culture, l'article fondateur coécrit avec la sériologue et anthropologue Norman Yoffi, Order, Wealth and Legitimacy, 1998, et sur les écritures anciennes et leur place dans les sociétés respectives, la collaboration depuis 2004 avec le mayaniste Stephen Houston que nous avons eu le plaisir d'accueillir il y a quelques semaines. N'hésitez pas à poser vos questions au professeur Baines en français ou en anglais à travers le chat en direct. Welcome to you all, and please ask your questions in the live chat, share your comments and participate. We'll gather your questions and Professor Baines will respond at the end of each of it, will respond at the end of his presentation. John, we're delighted to have you with us and thank you so much for accepting our invitation. We're looking forward to hearing you on ancient Egyptian writing, images and practices in between. Uh Thank you very much, Andreas, for your kind introduction. And uh, I want to start by remarking that my lecture is mainly about images rather than language, but the question of how images relate to language is central to it, and I hope, therefore, it will contribute to Ilara. Uh, and I should say that um, 
I have various terms in mind, and I should um, omit some of them. First, the terms that I want to talk about, um, therefore writing images and practices in between. Uh, so we, we have writing as images in ancient Egypt because hieroglyphs are pictures. And then we have pictures in the ordinary sense. And then we have the practices that come in between. I'll exemplify those in one moment. What I'm not going to talk about is ancient Egyptian cursive writing, which was nearly all the writing that was done, but is much less well uh, known because it doesn't survive so well. And it isn't so relevant to the types of questions I'm talking about today. Uh, so we concentrate on things like what I have in front of you now. Um, and I should also say that there are blind alleys in development, and I want to show you some of those as we go along. Now, my first image shows the king of Egypt. In fact, he's not really the king in the case like this, but we won't go into that, uh, offering cloth to the god Osiris. Uh, but the god Osiris is represented as a hieroglyph. Uh, this hieroglyph is, uh, has all sorts of associations. It's called the Jed. And as you can see, it's wearing clothes and it has eyes. So the hieroglyphs has become a kind of animate being. This is probably a cult object, but there are many conventions underlie an image like that. And these are the types of conventions that I want to explore. Um, and you will find, for some reason, my caption hasn't come up, but I expect it will in a moment. There, sorry. Uh, I, I have a caption for almost all the images, and so I hope that they, they will give you dates and things like that. But I also have this initial slide, and here you have uh, a chronology on the right, and my dates are within that chronology. And then on the left, the map, and I just run very quickly through the map from south to north. And uh, these are very approximate positions on the map showing you the site, the areas of Edfu and Harakompolis at the bottom. The Theban area is the next oval. Then the site of Abydos, where the earliest Egyptian writing has been found. The site of Mer in Middle Egypt, we have an image from there. Uh, the site, uh, well, an actually unknown site in the Fayum, um, somewhere near El Lahun, the next oval. Then a circle for the Memphis area, which is where the majority of my examples come from. Then um, Bubastis in the Delta, the next one, and then the Northwest Delta for at least one object. So that's just to give you a sense of how these things spread across the country. Uh, and mostly my captions will also tell you where things are from, but often it's not known. So I want to start way back in prehistory with this bowl. Uh, so the bowl has triangles, inverted triangles, which might in some way represent something like a landscape. We have to be very cautious about that. And then it alternates with these images which show a comb, an artifact in other words, which has the head of an antelope. So that is uh, clearly not a, a feature of nature. Uh, whereas the inverted triangles probably are. And so uh, people are mixing categories in creating an image like that already far back into prehistory. And they take this one step further in this other bowl where you have the same antelope headed comb and then you have uh, only preserved at the top, you have a dog which seems to be biting the tail of the antelope, but it's not an antelope, it's a comb. So this is mixing categories in a very complex way. It's a form of play. It probably also has a serious meaning, but we don't know what it is. Now these human potentials for play and for mixing and category crossing are universal than not things that people have to introduce and most children can handle them. Uh, 
but for some reason people think that they're strange in contexts of writing and things like that. So I think we should just assume that the Egyptians in developing um, ideas of this sort actually are uh, using general features of human intelligence to do it. Um, and we should not treat it as surprising, but it's very unfamiliar in terms of Western writing systems because they are detached from images. Here we have something which takes us a lot further along this mixing process. Uh, the most important feature in a way is on the far left where you have a straight line in the relief. <clears throat> and that shows you that we are at a stage in development where people are arranging compositions in registers. That's the front and back of an object on the left. And what I want to draw your attention to is the group. Um, wait, I think I've highlighted this in the other order. There you have on the second object, two standards which represent um, aspects of kingship probably. And they are given human hands so that they can hold captives. So presumably the king has captured these people. Uh, if you look below, the lion is probably also a figure of the king. On the left, the figure of the king is the bull. And here you have standards which have become, have acquired hands. So that, that seems to me to be a, a yet more sophisticated development of that idea. So we'll see more examples soon, but what I to call this type of representational play, I call emblematic representation, where you want, you have a, an element which in itself does not have visible agency, but you give it agency through the picture. And this makes it possible to do things with writing when we come to written signs uh, that you can't otherwise. These examples here probably coexisted with writing, but there happens not to be writing on, uh, well, there might be a piece of writing on the left, but let's not worry about that. So here, this is probably a, a generation or two later than the last image. The Nama palette is the point of departure for much in Egyptology, but um, it, Egypt, Egyptians, I think, thought of it as prehistory. It doesn't figure in later developments. Now, the Nama palette um, has lots of features to do with writing. And I've highlighted most of them there. So these are um, hieroglyphs, but not all of them can be read, uh, but still they visibly caption the figures. And, but they will do something more in an image or two's time. Um, we can also say that the composition operates in, on, in other ways, that it has registers and the top implies the sky. And so it is a sort of cosmography at the same time. Well, those are all those captions. If we then look at them again in a different way, uh, two of those three are the same as I had before. The third one is different. This is this group in front of the king. Now that hawk has a human hand and the human hand holds the, the head, holds a rope to the head. It has the head captive. Then there are six papyrus stems, which are quite plausibly there as numbers. And the flat shape is probably a sign for land. So this is a true emblematic composition where you have um, the human hand given to an animal being, in this case, a bird, uh, in order to make it, uh, give it human agency. Now it's probably a figure of a god. And here we come to another aspect of it, which is um, rules of decorum, which Andreas mentioned. So according to rules of decorum, um, you could not represent a deity in the full form of that deity in many contexts, including this one. Now the figures at the top I highlighted also, so that is the king's name shown in the context of a palace enclosure. And the king's name has agency as we'll see in the next picture or rather the next but one. Uh, <clears throat> so here, uh, the next picture is um, just a collection of examples of this emblematic 
personification. I haven't used the word personification up to now, but you can see it clearly here. So um, fortunately, quite simple hieroglyphs in the middle on the right, you have the hieroglyphs for life, duration and power, which are three attributes of, of the king, which the king acquires from the gods. Those three hieroglyphs are holding standards of the sort you've already seen. Um, at the top, you've got a variant example where an eye is written into the loop of the sign for life, the Anch sign. And this is something that occurs quite commonly that you, fi you find a way to animate something because pictorially it makes sense. And you see that particularly bottom left, a very much later example from the Greco-Roman period, where the jed, the middle sign on the right, has been put inside the loop of the Ankh sign, and it makes it into a kind of face. And the two um, staffs, which is probably what this was scepter is, um, have acquired heads and eyes, and so they've been animated. <clears throat> that is a common motif in later periods, but is not known from earlier. Uh, you can also, top left, um, give attributes to uh, a being that is animate in a different way, and so you have a tree which represents a goddess who is nursing a figure of the king, and so we, we therefore got abstractions, life and so on, uh, which uh, acquire human figures. It's quite rare to have examples like these ones that have legs, but uh, plenty, of, plenty are known nonetheless. Uh, or you can have deities who are represented in other forms and are given human arms in order to make them act, interact with humans. And then the bottom left case is really where you just have these qualities which are put together to make a freeze on a building. So that's a development which actually, th those examples range over about 1500 years. Uh, now we go back to the period where we were and uh, we have uh, three examples. On the top right you have Nama uh, and Nama, his name is written with a catfish and that catfish has been given human hands and um, they hold a stick with which he is smashing his enemies. Uh, and at the same time, this rather feeble bird there, um, that, that is a hawk. This is absolutely minute in scale, so we, we must excuse its lack of, of, of elan, let's say. You have the Ankh sign held by the hawk down for the catfish for Nama. And at the same time, the groups bottom left are actually regular language. Uh, and now the Ankh sign, we'll see other examples. The Ankh sign is a very flexible object. And so it, it can be detached and moved around. It is some, an artifact, you could say, but a rather special artifact. If you look to the middle image at the top, you've got again a catfish. It's perhaps a bit hard to make out, holding a mace right at the top. And um, it has a hand which holds the top knot of a captive, which it's about to smash with the mace. So that is the, uh, that is the catfish of Nama, whose name is also written on the far right. So he, he's present twice. The first one, I think, could be a sort of general characterization of what this object is. And then the middle one is the image of what he does. And there was a further image which is badly preserved on the left. The same thing happens on the far left with the probable successor of Nama, Aha, uh, who in this case, his name itself, uh, the whole image of his name has become an active being. And that is probably in part because a mace forms part of the writing of, the, of Aha's name. So again, people are exploiting the potential of these images, which are hieroglyphs. And so here uh, on the right, you have examples of hieroglyphs which have become artifacts of much later periods. Uh, the middle and the left ones are both true hieroglyphs. In other words, they're ones that you find regularly in the script, but the left one is the Ankh sign plus was for power, 
The right hand one is more like an amulet, but it does occur as a hieroglyph. And uh, that amulet is basically very similar to the Ark sign. And here, showing how transitory some of these developments are, uh, you've got four of these tags, which are similar to the one at the top middle and at the top left, which have writing all over them, but they don't have any of this fancy interplay with pictorial elements. And um, those date to the end of the same dynasty, the end of the first dynasty. So there was a development to create all these subtle pieces of interplay. And then for, at least for the purpose of the tags, it was abandoned. But uh, we shouldn't underestimate the kinds of meanings that can be attached to these things. And uh, here you have, if you remember the Nama palette, the Nama palette has a circle in the middle and that is a grinding area where in principle you would grind pigments. If you look bottom middle on this image, you see um, that there are traces of grinding, uh, of grinding a copper based material, which would have been for eye paint. Uh, the left hand palette I put in because that's one that was used to extinction to show that they really are used. And then what do they do? Well, the top two on the left give you something of that. Uh, there is this Egyptian notion of the ka, the vital spirit or something like that, we could call it, which is transmitted down the generations. And that seems to be closely associated with the palette and the grinding of the eye paint. So when you put eye paint perhaps on a deceased person's body or something of this sort, um, you would grind it on a palette and this would transmit the value of the car so that the, the palette and the material have an agency which is imparted by a ritual. On the right, you have the same thing. You've got the car sign visible there. And then at the top, you've got the Ant Jed Was that we've already seen, which are simply there as writing. Um, and that is a palette which was never used. And it's the latest known of this sort but it was probably a royal gift to a non-royal person because it comes from L1, a non-royal site. So again, we're, we're dealing with rapid developments, but with underlying ideas that have a very long history. And you can see that the Ankh sign, which you'd normally think had a stem, a single stem, has a double stem. And we'll see another example in a moment. Here we are. Um, so this is... Uh, an object, a very beautiful object in the Metropolitan Museum, which uh, mixes the ka. We, in fact, we've got both the same objects in the drawing of the palette on the right, but this is actually a vessel. It, it's a vessel for libations, and uh, it writes an and ka, which is also somebody's name. So it operates on several levels. And <clears throat> you can see from the way that the areas are drilled out that it is meant to uh, meant to hold liquids. You can also see that the Ankh sign is fully formed in the way it's done um, as a, a knotted piece of cloth, uh, uh, which has, well, in this case, a bifurcated descending element. And so uh, whether that's what the Ankh sign represents is a a rather uncertain point, but it certainly can represent that. So the Ankh sign is something that you can hold, that you can hand to someone that is effectively an agent that is freed from being just a sign in the script. And it probably originally was the piece of um, the amuletic object before it became the sign for life. Uh, all this moves, well, it moves in the lecture very fast. Uh, we've already gone through hundreds of years. And we get to a stage about three generations after the last image, when people are actually writing continuous language. And this then brings other changes with it. So uh, you've got there what is generally agreed to be the oldest piece of continuous writing in Egypt, uh, probably almost certainly not the oldest that existed, but the oldest that we can make sense of. And there is the text and translation. I don't want to go into details. That's the only bit of Egyptian transliteration that you'll see. 
uh, it's contemporary with the statue on the right, on the left, probably. And here you have um, somebody who was probably the same man as the owner of the statue, but he went under two names, Ha Sechen, Ha Sechen Mui. And the full form of Ha Sechen Mui's name is a syntactic sentence, which is there as a ceiling. So by this time, you've got language uh, having many more potential uses in writing than earlier, but the earlier forms retain their value as time goes along. And you've got a transitional example on the base of that statue. Uh, so there you see on the front um, some extremely dead corpses and then um, a figure, 47,209, I think it is. And uh, to the right, you've got a word for to smash. Uh, and um, then another corpse <clears throat> sprouting papyrus stems, presumably Lower Egypt, um, the Delta. And then along the side, that's the bottom of the image there, you have these amazing contorted corpses. Well, that is a development that didn't continue. But you can imagine that um, this interaction between these very loose forms and the tight forms of a script was a difficult thing to, to manage in, uh, and make meaningful. And perhaps that's one reason why that particular path was not taken later. And so that's the first example of something that changed and disappeared. Now, immediately after this, after the last image, about a generation later, you have the step pyramid at Saqqara, the largest early stone building that we know. And as you can see, especially bottom left, uh, it's uninscribed. So hieroglyphs and writing were not public phenomena at this date. There are always exceptions. The hieroglyphs were used publicly, but only in extremely remote parts of the world on the outside normal Egypt. Instead, hieroglyphs were used on um, very recherche objects of many sorts, which were used in cult and which were associated with statues and things like that, that were all internal to the affairs of the elite. And this is as internal as you can get, about 25 meters beneath the ground in the step pyramid complex. This is actually from the south tomb, it's a double tomb. Um, you have this relief of the king. We can be very confident that this was not the earliest use of these motifs, but it's the earliest example that we have. Um, so uh, here you have on the right, uh, Sorry, that's good that I put that first. You've got the sign here with the bifurcated stem held by this hawk at the top. So the hawk is giving life to the king as we saw with Nama. Uh, and there's a very distinctive and simple point here, which is that the sign is not vertical or horizontal, it's at an angle and signs of writing are normally vertical or horizontal. So it's clearly being used as an object as well as having uh, the meaning life. In addition to that, you have on the right, um, a couple of personified elements. The upper one is a was scepter, I think, but my own face is blocking it for me, um, holding a, fa uh, a fan. And the fan is, is associated with the idea of life in Egypt too. And it's using human hands to do that, but it's not being given legs. So it's different from, the examples we saw before. Then underneath that, you've got a much smaller sign, which is the was scepter. And it has its arms in a characteristic gesture, one arm up and the other against the chest, well, the chest of a hieroglyph. And that is a dance, which is known as a henu in Egyptian. Uh, but you cannot make a sentence, was em henu, uh, that would be Egyptian as it were, power in a, a dance doesn't make any sense. So this is something which is a pictorial device, which uses a hieroglyph to convey um, meaning, but it doesn't convey a meaning that you can simply reduce to language. On the bottom left, you've got another 
a, a little bit of a conundrum there where you've got another Ankh sign. Uh, it's damaged, so we can't see, but I don't think it was animated in any way. And what it's doing sitting in the middle of the decorated field, I don't know. Uh, there were lots of other examples in the um, step pyramid complex of steely like this one on the left here. And this gives you another form of this personification of elements. So you've got the king's name, the hawk on the palace. We've seen that before. Then on the right, it's damaged. But uh, this is the element I'm talking about. It's called an imiute. It is a slaughtered jackal, apparently, on a stem. And this is some sort of protective ritual object, which is reaching out power to the king, the was hieroglyph again. Uh, and uh, it's also doing the same with life, Anch, which you can see in the bottom, well, about the middle of that group. So there you animate the imiut uh, with these elements in order to make it act uh, for the king. And you can say that um, from the king's name for, and further left, it's all just writing. Uh, at the top, you've got a jackal, which may actually caption the imiut, but the, unfortunately this is lost, so we can't say any more about that. Well, these are very, very long-lasting motifs. And here you have a couple of 4th century BCE uh, stele. They're actually two copies of the same thing from the delta, uh, the northern delta. And I will show you a detail now. So here uh, you've got the scene, the king on both sides offers to the deity, the goddess Nate, uh, and you've got the same elements as you saw with Josa uh, still be in use here. But uh, this, um, most Egyptologists I think would agree with me, this doesn't look quite right. Um, the elements are much too big in relation to the scale of the rest. And probably this shows that these are motifs which had been archaeologically found on ancient sites. We know there was plenty of refinding of ancient things in this period. And then they were put here. But you can also see another useful point. Uh, you've got the scorpion on top of a cartouche. Uh, and the scorpion has the sort of, it looks as if it has hands. Uh, the pincers of a scorpion work as hands. The scorpion in this context is protective. And then underneath you've got the jed, which we've seen already, and that's been given human arms, and it holds something on its head. Uh, if we were to use normal rules of Egyptian writing, that what's on its head should write the name of the god Amun. But I don't know if that's the right answer. I think it probably isn't. Um, so uh, how that works in detail, we don't know. And these things which are quite widespread cannot be reduced to language. We, uh, we can say that these are important symbols and the ones th at the top, you've got the idea of the fan again. The pair beneath look as if they are door sockets. But what a door socket means as a symbol, we don't understand. But still, uh, this is a play between ideas of protection and uh, language and full images, as you have immediately next to it in the form of the figure of the king. Well, developments also move towards how you use language and uh, show it. And here you have um, a very important early example, again from Josa. So we've gone back to where we were. And um, this is here, really, just the photograph. I'll move to the drawing because it's easier to explain what this is about. And we have a set of conventions that have developed here. First, uh, something which you'll see quite a few examples of, but it's not in the long term standard in Egyptian art, and that is you use different sizes of hieroglyph. So the, those groups there are larger than the ones to the left, to their left. And those are uh, nonverbal statements. Uh, say uh, this is a figure of a god, and probably there was another one on the right. Uh, and it says, giver of life, duration, and power, and joy forever. Um, normally, that's actually used of the king rather than of a god in later times. Uh, 
Then on the left, you've got a group and on the right, uh, and that group says speech. And underneath you have speeches by these gods, which very unusually in the first person plural. Uh, and the speeches um, are therefore a, a special thing that gods can do to kings, but kings do not do to gods. It, so this is all very hierarchical. If you have a speech, it needs to be enclosed with speech markers in order to have its validity and probably some notion of protection. And so this is all in a very, um, a very uh, high register, let's say. It's, um, it's representations of gods, kings, and interactions between them, and then concepts which associate these groups. Um, you won't find these, as we'll see with other practices, when you're outside royalty. And here we move to uh, the non-royal sphere, but only a very short distance to it. This is the highest elite of the of a contemporary of Josa. And here you have uh, things that develop in the use of hieroglyphs. Now, the left-hand image there is mainly the titles and name of Hezi Re, who is this, the owner of this group of objects. Uh, the middle one is simply titles and name, um, but the, the, the first one has another element there, and we'll see more examples. It has a, a libation vessel on top of that group, then it has a hand with water, then another vessel, uh, which is also a water vessel, and a pot, probably, which is the recipient of the water. Uh, you can't reduce those to writing. Those are hieroglyphs, effectively, which are used as um, emblems of an action, a very important action, but they look like hieroglyphs. They're in a group with hieroglyphs, but they're working in a different way. And we'll find other examples of that sort of thing. And on the right, then, you have an even more striking case where you've got Hezi Re, who is holding a libation vessel and a circular object, and those are hieroglyphs. So uh, they write his name, and the circular object writes Re, the sun god, uh, and Re is written, can I use my cursor? Yes, I can. Re is written like this here. That's the normal way to do it for a non-royal person in this period, uh, whereas the, the sun disk is really a fantastically important symbol. I should also point out that Re is written there on the same object as he's holding his, his name. That's a play which I don't know of from later periods. So again, some of these things come and go. And then we move a couple of generations to the beginning of the fourth dynasty. And this is where we begin to get the repertory of scenes, which we have in tombs of the old kingdom, which of which there are uh, more than a thousand decorated examples. The, these are the oldest examples. Now, very sadly, this material was dispersed and pretty much destroyed in the late 19th century. So we have to rely on these um, mid 19th century drawings, which were uh, really just sketches. But um, you can see that this crams an enormous amount of meaning into a small space. You've got uh, left middle, the tomb owner, Nevermat, and then um, he's there again on the right. The, in the dead middle is his wife, Itet. And then you've got scenes of animals being slaughtered and brought as sacrifices. You've got boat making and so on. But uh, And there are plenty of hieroglyphs, but we won't comment on them, except for um, this group here, which says he made um, his probably hieroglyphs, but it says gods, uh, in writing that could not be erased. Sadly, that wasn't true. Um, there is the detail of the same, that element at the top I've enlarged here. And you can see that there's Nefamat on the left. He is netting birds for his wife, Itet, who is on the right. And there are three boys, uh, and they are taking the birds to their mother. Uh, and Nefamat has his titles and name written in extremely large hieroglyphs in the middle. And then the boys have their names written in smaller hieroglyphs. 
Um, and they sort of merge into the big ones for Nevermat. That's a treatment that you're not going to find in any later period. And the really large hieroglyphs are uh, giving him a, a status that <clears throat> is otherwise not to be seen, shown this way. Uh, and then on the far right, you've got her name in front of her, also small hieroglyphs. The image beneath is just to show you that um, the complexity of these ideas, another bird netting scene from elsewhere in the tomb, and the names are the same as they are at the top. So uh, you've got an extraordinary piece of role play according to which the tomb owner can net birds for his wife, something that's physically impossible. I've studied that point. Because, um, and uh, then, so you have a role play. This is done for the wife presumably is an ultimate offering to her. I wish I'd known about this um, 10 years ago when I published something related, but I, I, it had escaped me. And then we move to the tomb of Rehotep, which is just nearby. They're both at my doom and roughly contemporary. And you have the lintel uh, or architrave at the top of um, the wall there. And that gives you the titles of Rehotep. Rehotep is, um, he's got a, he's said to be a prince or son of the king, but I would never trust that. It can always be a title you were given. And then he's got many, many titles, reading from right to left. Uh, and those are um, separated by vertical lines. They are as if they were in a table. Now, tables are highly prestigious, as you can see immediately beneath in the tables of offerings and the table on the right, which is hieroglyphs and offering, uh, hieroglyphs above and then offerings below and different ratios between them. These are things that will be offered to him for the next world. And <clears throat> they are objects of the very highest value, gold and silver and things of that sort. And then if you look at the middle group there uh, and in, in the middle of the middle group, you've got um, Rehotep's titles and name um, written in extraordinarily large hieroglyphs. Um, it's particularly the right-hand column. Uh, these are his most important titles. And that's a practice which then is not found in later periods. So uh, you're doing things with hieroglyphs here to give them a value that you won't find um, in, in the same forms in later times. And there finally you have Rehotep and his wife, uh, their statues, these are very famous. Um, and uh, as it's been pointed out, you've got an interplay between writing and three-dimensional image. So the titles of Rehotep on the left do, do not end with a determinative or classifier. There's no human figure to end the group because the human figure is his statue but there is gender discrimination and his wife does have a hieroglyph of a woman to end her name. Um, she also has just one title, uh, so the, the, those two in inscriptions are duplicates. <clears throat> there, there's nothing to be surprised at there. You've got marked and unmarked characteristics in languages and in writing, as you can see here. And then we move down a generation or two to uh, these things called slab stele, which were part of the burial ritual of really high ranking people a, a generation or two later when the elite had largely lost the capacity to have pictorial decoration. They gained it again quite quickly after that. And, but you've got here this amazing range of uses of hieroglyphs, uh, very large hieroglyphs on the right and at the top, with the most important titles of Wepem Nofret, who is a very high ranking person. Slightly smaller, his name directly above him. And then um, vertical columns, which are lists of things. But if you look at the table in front of him and the groups underneath, you're, you're going at the boundaries between language and non-language. And we'll see other examples of this. And then we come uh, to this woman, um, Nafretiabet, who is in Paris. So when the Louvre reopens, you can go and look at her. 
and she um, has a similar treatment from Webb and Nofret with subtle differences. Uh, she's got less material because women have fewer titles uh, and um, so other elements are made much larger. And here we compare them directly and we've got the group that I highlighted for um, Hezi Re here in front of Webb and Nofret. He gets the very best. He has the washing sign and then underneath it he has a copper uh, water vessel with a gold spout and then the the catching vessel underneath it. She has to make do with a ceramic version of the same thing. So here again we have gender hierarchies but particularly in, the, in her case you can see how the signs have been fitted into the context so that they don't come together really. Uh, we can certainly say this means washing your hand but we can't reduce that to language. Uh, so hieroglyphs are used because you can find that hieroglyph used in a linguistic context, but here it's basically not used linguistically. So we, we're having another sort of third term between picture and writing. Uh, we go hundreds of years later now to look at how you can do other things between image and writing in a different way. Now I said already that these speech markers of gods to kings are very restricted. You don't find them or you hardly find them on non-royal monuments. You will always find exceptions to anything I say. Now in this case um, you've got, the, this is the entrance and uh, facade of a tomb. Uh, you have the man on the left, uh, it's the same person four times, uh, and it says he says. And so uh, what he says is the text that's above. So this is linking three things. It's linking the text to him, it's linking an action to him, and at the same time he has this gesture, which is a speech gesture. So it's, um, it's highly redundant as a way to arrange the composition. On the right, the left-facing figure doesn't leave space for the he says, but uh, a left-facing figure has an open palm in speech, and that is a stronger signal than the right-facing figure where you get the back of the hand. And so it, it's more powerful in a certain sense. But uh, in both cases, <clears throat> you have the idea that a gesture and hieroglyphs kind of interact or uh, can replace each other. Uh, you come to, this is a couple of generations later than the last image, perhaps, perhaps three generations. Uh, and here you have a subtle range of uses of hieroglyphs, but a, a very rare one. Uh, so you've got the tomb owner and his wife there. And above him, you have three lines of his titles and his name. And above her, three columns of smaller ones. So the same sort of gender difference that we've seen before. <clears throat> and neither of them has the determinative at the end of the name. And so um, the figures are integrated with the writing. Then on the right, you have the biographical text for him. Now it's extremely rare not to have any signal at the beginning of these texts that this is a speech by him. Uh, and so we have to see this as being something that comes together as a whole and should not be decomposed even as much as I've done in talking about it. Uh, and so this is yet another way to get round the sets of conventions that operate and constrain how you can do these things. Well, um, that was one group of material. We now move to another one um, where we're going back in time. And we go back to the same date here as Rehotep and Nevermat, and you have King Snofru at Darshur uh, and his mortuary temple. And you've got these women who are um, offering, um, offering benefits, let's be nice and vague, to the king. They are in a register beneath a figure of the king and a deity. Now, that's unfortunately lost. Uh, and then you've got, uh, bottom left, you've got another example of the same type of composition, and you can see more clearly about the king and the deity. Deity was on the left, the king was on the right. 
and another uh, color photograph on the right showing just a single one of these figures. Now, all these figures are actually um, relating to something else. Uh, the women have on their heads a sign for a settlement, above that a sign for an estate, um, and uh, then be, uh, between the figure and the next figure forward, you have the name of the estate. If you take the right-hand one in the photograph, uh, it means the dancers or the dances of Snofru, the king. And the next one means the road or way of Snofru and so on. Uh, so these are, these are women who personify estates of the king. And if you look at the bottom image, it's clearer that these unk signs um, are not vertical, as I pointed out earlier. So they are active. So they are actively bringing life to the king. And there's no running text to say that. Now, these people are essentially transformations of lists. Uh, so you have a basic rule in uh, in the hierarchy in pictorial representation, pictures have precedence over running text. Uh, we've seen how much that's flouted with the biographical text a moment ago. And um, uh, also, uh, pictures, uh, so pictures have, uh, have precedence over text, action has pre precedence over writing. And the writing is made to act by little details like those slanted unk signs, playing very much with margins. Um, you've got another example here from, this is going to be a generation later, the Great Pyramid, two generations perhaps. Um, and there is <clears throat> um, a little text on the left. Now that text is written retrograde, as we would say as Egyptologists, the columns read from left to right against the way in which the signs face. And what that shows is that this is based on a, a practice which was in, used in written texts um, in, hari in cursive writing, um, either semi-cursive or fully cursive writing, and then was transcribed onto the monuments. So this probably comes from a book of annals or something like that, which then were made into a picture. And in this case, the picture would still have priority over the text. The picture faces, in a sense, the proper way it faces the way that, uh, that the writing is read. <clears throat> and it, it is the name of this ship, which is underneath, which is uh, a very grand statement about a rather trivial looking ship. Well, this type of practice then proliferates. So here you have a photograph of something that was just published two or three months ago uh, from the site of Abu Sir, the most informative site for this sort of thing in the third millennium. Uh, on the right, there was a scene probably of the arrival of the king or something like that lost. On the left is what we're wanting to look at. Now the photograph is, is great, but it's easier to see it in a drawing. Um, and you have here several categories of being. Uh, you've got these fat, uh, people, I call them fecundity figures, and they are actually personifications of the back swamps of areas of the delta. And each of them has a different name. Um, and you can see there are a dozen of them. <clears throat> and then they have a column of writing in front of them, and the column of writing gets, states the benefits which they bring to the king. The, king, the king's temple will be far off picture to the left. Uh, and uh, those four columns have to be read together because they only together do they give you the full range of gifts that these people will bring. Uh, note how they're holding a libation vessel at an angle and the, and the offering table they hold, which also is a hieroglyph, is again at an angle. Further left, you have these women, they are personifying estates, as you saw with the Snoff, for example. And, but that's not the only variation. You have another one, uh, there the woman. She is again an estate, but an estate of a higher order than the ones you've, you've got on the right. Um, and uh, that is signified by the fact she, that she holds the libation vessel and the offering table. 
Then on the far left, you have another personification. This is a personification of a province. And the province uh, doesn't need to move. The man is just standing there. He's not holding offerings because uh, he is most of the way to being a deity. And so he, it, he has this higher status of simply of simple presence. Uh, and so these very subtle distinctions that are made all bring to life the idea that the royal estates and the provinces and the particular geographical features all contribute to the king's well-being in the next world. Uh, and um, these um, are done pictorially, but from lists. Um, here, also from Sahure, you have a case where you've got a very different thing. We can't go into detail, but you've got this caption highlighted there, which tells you about an action of the king. The action of the king is this business of netting birds, which we saw um, Nefamat doing a few images back. Uh, and so that is highlighted there. And this is giving you a way in which actions are conveyed also in temple reliefs by separation of the groups of hieroglyphs. In addition, you've got personifications. This is extremely rare. Um, and they are doing the same sort of thing as you saw before. Um, in this case, she's giving him waterfowl in the swamp. Uh, and that is a personification of the swamp, uh, in this case, female. Um, and then the next figure is a figure who is called food or um, provision. And so these are personifications. What's very rare here is you have ordinary human figures in principle, bottom, middle, and this is uh, mixes humans and abstractions in a way that you hardly ever see. Now you can see grids on that drawing, I hope they're visible. Uh, and those show you that these figures were found so interesting in later periods, probably in the first millennium BCE, that they were copied. So these are very important phenomena, but they were never repeated in the same form later, so far as we know. Uh, you could also use this interface between lists and other forms of representation in other ways. This is a generation or two after Sahure, and you have uh, what is effectively a table of of geographical regions on the top left, which is then animated by having figures doing things. And at the same time, you've got the hieroglyph for West. I should have highlighted it, there it is, um, which is made into a divider from the table. It springs from just a line. Uh, and then a line at the bottom <coughs> right, goes right off to the right. <coughs> and um, Further down, you have something which is fully realized as a kind of landscape representation. And so here you've got underlying lists. Lists talk about regions or something of the sort. And then um, these things are made into tables which have pictures in them. They're, they just probably existed in a cursive written form. And then they were transformed into images in a temple. Well, um, other developments were going in a rather different direction. <clears throat> this is more or less contemporary with what you just saw. Uh, and you've got scenes from mortuary temples. The inner parts are much less kind of dynamic than what you just saw. And you have here um, this feature of this uh, scene title or caption. Uh, then the king's name above, that is in a form you don't see later, and the deity with an extensive speech marker followed by caption. So, and then um, let's just say that the one on the left is a very beautiful object, but we can't talk about it in detail. You have the same phenomenon as we've been seeing before, but in, uh, I gave you an imiut, which was almost off picture. Here is the king's car. So the king's car is this vital spirit, which comes down the generations and it is personified by being put on a standard. And then you've got the car hieroglyph, which has enfolds the king's name. So the king's car is kind of present in ritual actions and so on, and is quite commonly depicted. 
but it can interplay, uh, have complex interplays with writing or with pictorial images. Uh, later, <clears throat> maybe a century later, you have this relief here, which is developing similar principles. And here you've got the winged disc, which you can have only above figures of king and deities. And then you have um, the goddess holding out the unsign to the king. Uh, and she actually, the text there very unusually says giving life, but life is in the plural. And we do have cases where people hold more than one unsign. So that is meaningful. And then <clears throat> um, on the left, you have a personification of the Delta. And the, this personification cannot interact directly with a figure of the king. That would be against rules of decorum. And so the king's name is used. So you, you've got a, something between writing and image here. You've got another similar thing on the right uh, where uh, you've got the king's name again. And then you've got this intermediate being, Yun Mutef, who is halfway to being a deity, is more of a deity than the personification of the Delta, and so has the speech marker and a little speech. So these are very complex so gradings that happen in seemingly simple compositions. They continue for thousands of years, so because this is from the Temple of Edfu, third century BCE. And I just pick out here this group to show you uh, things we also see in other forms, uh, where you've got these hieroglyphs. Uh, so this hieroglyph here is actually a hieroglyph representing clothing, but it's used as an offering. It's, it's a picture which at the same time is an object. You've got a figure of a sphinx with hands, which is a figure of the king offering, which was a, quite a common motif. And that's a very, it's very stylized and very minimal as, as pictorial representation. Mostly in late periods, you see something a bit more like a picture, let's say. Similar things are being done by non-royal people, but I'm worried about time. So I think I'll perhaps um, just say generally that the same sort of distinctions in si sizes of signs, orientation, you see these different groups are differently oriented according to which way the figures are facing, all give meaning to these compositions. And here you've got <clears throat> a case, this is just at 90 degrees from the last picture, where um, there's a man playing a, um, a, a flute, a, a tr transverse flute, and uh, the hieroglyph shows a transverse flute which is not a normal hieroglyph at all. And um, the word for it is written, it's broken, so we can't say exactly what the word is, but um, you've got the way uh, the, here, a way in which you can always adapt your hieroglyph to the pictorial context. Here um, in a non-royal tomb, you've got the idea of presentation of um, product, products of the land, um, animals and birds in this case, and the upper registers, um, uh, particularly there, you've got how these things are adapted as they go along. That name is visibly written after the rest of the relief was carved. But at the bottom, you have this remarkable presentation of birds where um, you've got enormous figures next to them. So uh, the group here says 121,200 of that type of bird, species of bird, not type, perhaps a better way to put it. And these, again, derive from the idea of lists. And in other cases, you will see a papyrus being presented rather than these animate figures here. But the, effectively, the birds are just representing masses. But they're made very pictorial with this group here, for example. Uh, you can use hieroglyphs as wallpaper, as you might say. Uh, the pyramid texts in the burial chambers of kings. Uh, uh, these chambers are completely covered in hieroglyphs, but they're very artfully arranged. As you can see, you use different scales to pick out the king's titulary here. And um, those are ritual spells which will help the king to exist in the next life. Well, we're going to do, uh, as it says there, an extremely short trip to China. Again, looking at this 
way in which things develop and then uh, lose elements or some some developments are not followed. Uh, the Huanbei and Anyang periods are the chief ones that we look at here. And there is the site of Anyang, where the main material will come from, and Zhengzhou, to the south, is where the earlier examples come from. Uh, so here is the, some of the earliest known writing from China um, on sherds, <clears throat> and as you can see, bright red sherds with single signs or very few signs on them from burials of at this site of Shaoshang Chao, which is on the edge of Zhongzhou. Here are roughly contemporary amulets, which have these signs, and particularly the top right here, they look distinctly pictorial. Those signs can be closely compared um, in the whole range of what's been found, you haven't seen the range, uh, with what is known from Anyang, showing you that the somewhat earlier material, a few generations earlier, is fully within the tradition of the later stuff and presumably other forms also existed at that date. And here is essentially confirmation. The oracle bones are the principal known writing of the period. On the left, you've got the back or the plas turtle plastron with the incised signs. On the right, you've got the back, which has the, the cracking points where these uh, pits on it, and you've got there a detail, uh, you've got some of this writing which is in ink. One must assume that the main form of writing was ink, but of course it doesn't survive on bamboo strips, which was were what was used, but you've also got the sign there uh, from another object showing a scribe, uh, uh, used as a word for an official. Uh, these signs, uh, or signs like the ones on the amulets, are then used on bronzes, not very commonly, uh, but still there are hundreds of examples known uh, among the many thousands of bronzes, but they're always in very discreet places, either inside or, in this case, underneath the handle with the rubbing on the right, but you can see these are pictorial signs or closely, very close to being pictorial. In the case of this splendid vessel on the left, the signs are on the inside and they are made, they are pictorial and they're in high relief, but they don't interrupt the decorated outside. <clears throat> I think these decorated forms must have been so important that they couldn't be disturbed with writing, with exceptions as always. We'll see an exception in a moment. Here's another very splendid vessel with the signs on the left which are inside the vessel. Uh, by the way, I did uh, the first image, which I passed very quickly, said that I owe all this material to Tsao Dajra in particular. This is not my own research. Here you have three vessels, um, pan, water vessels, uh, and they have different rules. Um, and this is what, probably because the decoration is on the inside, which it mo mostly isn't. Uh, the top left one has a mixture of relief and incised decoration, and there is a rubbing on the right, and you have there a couple of signs of writing with somebody's name. Uh, then the bottom left-hand one, you have to believe me, has some writing there in among this um, Taotie element, or the, well, it's it's got this face element, but it's all something like a snake in the overall design. Uh, and then on the right, you have the most famous woman in early China, Fu Hao, and her name is written on a water vessel of hers next to comparable decoration. So for some reason, you could not put the writing in the exterior areas. An extreme case here from rather later, uh, where you have this rhino, undecorated on the outside, it didn't need decoration, I guess. And on the inside, it has an inscription in four columns. And that is in writing, which is much less pictorial than what I've just shown you. Though the, if you take the sign here, you've seen an example of that. I confess I can't read Chinese myself. But, uh, and this is really where Tsao Dajra's 
research is particularly important, he has assembled these enormous numbers of these things which are traditionally called clan names, and they have this largely pictorial form. You've seen an example of this one uh, on that relief vessel, for, um, in relief on a vessel. Uh, and some of them combine um, elements of more than one of the signs. And um, he is offering readings to these as administrative titles. Uh, here you have more examples. And uh, these are important because they show a hierarchy. So this element here is thought to mean a deputy, a subordinate. And this element, if I'm getting it right, is a leader. Um, those elements are known also in the earlier early gang um, Huanbei stage. Uh, and these are cases where you move from the Anyang period to the Western Zhou conquest. Uh, and the, these signs continue in use in the Western Zhou, but not for very long. So here are the Anyang cases above with the Western Zhou ones underneath. Uh, you can see, you can clearly pick out the similarities, but the signs underneath proliferate and are far less pictorial. And there is an example of how things are evolving more generally. The upper vessel is from probably just a couple of decades before the lower one. Uh, the Western Jaw conquest comes between the two of them. Uh, and uh, we're getting writing that's looking much more like later Chinese writing. Uh, we skip 800 years, no, just 600, and we get the bell set of the Marquis Yi of Zhong. Uh, and uh, this gives you a type of development which you could compare with some of that writing on those bronzes we just saw. Uh, but um, it then vanishes. So if you look at that bell, it is inscribed in the middle of the front. Um, and here is one where it's inlaid in gold. My, uh, the images, my supplier of images says that the, the un-inlaid uh, ones are more beautiful. But these Chinese signs are completely different in shape from normal Chinese writing. And so that is a type of development that did not go any further. Um, so you've got various things that were happening with Chinese writing in the, into the Warring States period and then vanished. And on the right here, you can see how Chinese writing was thought of in later periods, or probably from about then onwards, that um, your writing fits into imaginary, or in this case, uh, physically present squares. And so all the signs, however, beautiful and calligraphic they may be, are of similar size. Only in extravagant calligraphy do you break that basic rule. And just the last Chinese example is of a poem uh, written on a picture. And we can see, of course, that the Chinese put image and text together in totally different ways from how Egyptians do. And so that poem is basically it's very, very calligraphic, the calligraphy of an emperor, uh, but it is um, written roughly in squares. And so the early developments were lost. Well, back to Egypt. Now, the name of China is Middle Kingdom, but we are talking about Middle Kingdom Egypt. And we have another phase of development, which then goes its own way or disappears. Uh, this is one of the most famous objects in the Louvre, in the Louvre Stila C14, and it has these very, very subtle gradations in decoration. And also the hieroglyphs, uh, as you look particularly at the bottom on the right, you can see that they lean slightly to the left. It's almost as if they were a copy of a cursive model rather than being uh, geometric in the way hieroglyphs are normally in geometric groups. Not, And you can see this leaning again of the signs here, and this use of different depths of cutting is not standard either. Uh, and then underneath you've got a unique, or not probably unique, but very rare feature where you've got this idea that um, you offer, through, you open a door and then make an offering to the deceased, and the details of the door posts are in the drawing, in the carving. 
Now, this text is also very important because it has a, it's a semi-secret text, very, very difficult and elusive about the trade of an artist. So you can be confident that what was done on this stela was done with the very the most careful intentions and it used all these subtle features which you don't normally see. Uh, this other stela must be roughly contemporary with it and um, it, very sadly, we lost the top. We also, in particular, if you look at the top on the right, there's, we're missing a piece of relief there. I'll show you some details now, but you can see a very distinctive style of carving, um, not identical, but related. Uh, and so you've, at the top, you've got um, incised hieroglyphs, then you've got a relief band, come back to that. And then you've got relief further down with these women and the caption to them ab above them. And um, more people in relief at the bottom with offerings there too. Uh, if we see that still larger, we've got this anomalous element here. That is a hieroglyph. It means a thousand. And um, you have thousands of offerings, an absolutely standard element, but you, I don't know other cases where you've just got this thousand sign all by itself. And then the elements to which it relates are these pictorial elements beneath, but not really like a picture, more like a kind of spread of hieroglyphs, but it's a bit of both. On the left, you've got these incised hieroglyphs, which give um, what they are doing. They're, so they, they are, those are ritual actions of the women so that they are on a different level of meaning from the raised relief hieroglyphs which caption them. And at the bottom you've got a door uh, which is uh, sort of inserted into the composition in a rather arbitrary way. It has eyes, it opens, it's where the deceased could look through to make sense, uh, uh, to receive offerings and it, that, that makes sense therefore for the viewer, sorry. Uh, here you've got uh, another detail. So the last line of the inscription, and then underneath that you had a list of gods with, separated by vertical lines. So lists, as I said, are a very important element, and here they've been realized in a particular way on the stela with the name uh, of, of the owner in a double column on the left, a double line, sorry. Underneath you have this completely weird relief band, which is actually a representation of a ritual of a funeral. And it has here a couple of unk signs used as pictorial elements uh, and probably conveying some significant meaning. We do have parallels for these scenes, but this is the only case I know where they are executed this way on a stela. And this group here uses hieroglyphs uh, you've got hieroglyphs in the band underneath that bed there. And then you've got a representation of what I take to be a sled, which would be what the, the corpse would be dragged along, um, uh, dragged on uh, while it was being taken to the tomb. So uh, a very complex set of ideas, which probably had some, a linguistic counterpart, but it's... Um, uh, it can't entirely be understood. So you don't get later developments like that, basically. Uh, two generations later, different use again. You have uh, rules I've implied that non-royal people can't be shown with kings or gods. So you have the non-royal person there. He's separated by an enormous inscription from the semi-pictorial element at the top, but it is only semi-pictorial. You, the hieroglyph for the god is turned into a large figure to, and it interacts emblematically with the figure of the king. But this is essentially writing. That, sorry, that's a detail, we can skip that. This is a set of motifs which are used in many ways as time goes along. The, essentially the top is the same here. Underneath it's worth showing you this because here's somebody taking advantage of chance. Um, so his name is Sehetep Ibre Anch, uh, and Sehetep Ibre was the name of the first king of the dynasty, which is written here, and then the Anch is duplicated. 
And then the ka element, which as I say is to do with generations, is made into a standard. So he's taken his name and turned it into an emblem, which signifies how he should receive offerings in the next life. In other cases, uh, because of these rules that say you can't have a picture of the king, you write the year date, which is a prestigious thing to have on a stela, right at the top, and then uh, you have the, the hieroglyph of the sky showing that you do have something royal, but it's just the king's name that's present. Uh, note this interplay between raised and sunk relief, which is used in many meaningful ways. These are later examples of the same sort of thing, but um, you've got a difference in scale of hieroglyphs here. So these hieroglyphs are too big to work as hieroglyphs. They're used as if they were pictures. On the left, you have indeed a man before a god, but the god is the god Min, who is an exception to all the rules that we tell you about how you can mix people and gods and things like that. So it's not really an exception. Uh, other cases from slightly later date, you've got a god and um, a, a non-royal person on the right there, but separated by several columns of writing. And here at the top of the two stele of this man, uh, you have on one side the winged disc, that's the lower one, with the king's name, but written in a rather odd way, let's not go into detail. On the other side, on the other stele, you have these figures of gods, and yes, they are figures of gods, but they are too small to be full pictures, and the hieroglyphs that around them uh, that, that surround them give names, but not completely. So you actually have to read those figures as signs in the script at the same time. This man had a third stealer, which did another play. In this case, you've got a standard up here, um, which is of the god Wawet. It's captioned that way, uh, and a mini mini figure of. Uh, the owner, presumably, we can't quite see, uh, who is offering to this standard, and then he's shown adoring beneath. Uh, <clears throat> this is a temple scene, and here we're just going to look in the middle here, uh, and this is just to show you the extraordinary subtlety and variation that you get among the, in this sort of material. That is the first pillar you would come to on the left of what's shown in the, uh, in the highlight there. There is the detail. And the far left, those four figures are actually figures of priests. Sorry, three figures. Uh, and the middle one, this is totally exceptional, is a figure of the god Thoth, but not really of the god Thoth, of somebody performing the role of the god Thoth as a priest. You've then got a picture of a chapel. Inside the chapel is the god Amun offering uh, life to the figure, to the king's name. It's the same sort of emblematic things we've been seeing before. At the bottom, you here you have a figure of the god Osiris made into a giant emblem, and here a figure of the king. That's a picture not of the king, but of a statue of the king. So we're doing representation as a double remove. And this contrasts with the next pillar in, which has a conventional scene of Amun offering to the god. So in the outer position where people might see it more, it's less protected, you've got this very indirect form of representation. In the other case, a slightly more direct form. Uh, some people think this is the masterpiece of all this subtle play with representational forms. Um, and here you've got a, it's a lintel from a doorway in a temple. Uh, you've got the god Sobek of the Fayum, and he is represented as a standard, which has human arms holding life and power out to the king, but he's also captioned with his name in full-sized hieroglyphs. So it plays at the margin and you've got another god over here. We have to, we can't linger, I'm sorry. Um, from a later period, you have here, just here's a standard temple scene with relatively simple captioning. And uh, here I would pick out what's on the left. This is the god Sokar, whose name is written here. Uh, and 
you have the convention that what he does for the king is placed as close to the king as or the king's hieroglyphs as possible, like this. Uh, and then you have the, the God, that's in the third person. In the first person, you have the, the God's speech, and that has the speech marker for it. So again, you're keeping all these categories apart wherever you can. Uh, contemporary with that last picture is this where the bark of the God is carried out in procession. So this has complicated the conventions because of the fact that it's an exterior scene. <clears throat> so this is third person describing what the God Amun does. That's the God Amun's name. Over here, it says speech. I have given um, life and power, all life and power to Hatshepsut. Um, uh, and then this is a, a scene title. We've seen one of them before, but it's in a different context here, where um, you have an infinitive construction, so a nonverbal construction, uh, which says making a good start uh, on the way to perform this ritual. That would be the block to the left. Much later in the same period, a very simple example, but showing you the range of subtle variation you get. What's unusual here is the very small scale of the hieroglyphs in the top of the scene. And in this case, very, very rare, you've got speech markers for the god on the far left, and then the hieroglyphs facing the other way for the king. But the king is not called king in the normal way. That is an ab an abnormal way of captioning the king. This means king only as ritual performers, because you cannot represent a human being in front of a god, so you do it through a picture of the king. All these conventions are then understood and transmitted later, and here you have um, a, um, a revival type of stela of uh, Psammeticus II, very similar to the Nectanebo one I showed you earlier where the emblematic groups in the top of the decoration are really just like those of 1500 years earlier. <clears throat> but all sorts of other exciting things were happening in the same general period. This um, woman is shown, perhaps that she's meant to be wearing a dress, which is completely covered in images of gods. This is a bronze, and you've got a play on this idea of emblematic forms in her pectoral. So the pectoral is held up uh, by a lively figure with Einstein's slanting. That is a figure of, means kind of eternity, uh, and it implies that the pectoral is something like a, a temple. So an extraordinarily complex set of ideas go to, to produce that little uh, drawn element on her dress. And then you've got, sorry, I didn't um, explain the figures on the right. These are sphinxes. We saw one of them in the Edfu scene earlier. A sphinx with human hands enables a figure of the king to be shown horizontally in a, uh, in a context where otherwise this would not be possible. And then these are used as votive offerings. The lower one, the hands are very remarkable because they they almost look like an animal's paws. It's as if... The, there is a fusion of um, lion and, and person, which is even more thorough than in the one at the top. Uh, once you had this idea of using the body for hieroglyphs, you could do amazing things with it, as here, uh, where um, somebody sets up a statue in a temple, which would then have libation water poured over it. That would benefit him. But the water would then be collected to form uh, magical remedies to drink. And all sorts of very exciting things are done with the pictures in these contexts. The Metternich Stela is perhaps the most famous such example. But here, think about how hieroglyphs are being used. Um, so the car sign is there. The car sign is transmitting the sun disk at sunrise, which is depicted here. Underneath, you have a hieroglyph, uh, a hieroglyph for a stretch of water, uh, which implies that you've got the ocean out of which the sun rises, and that is all then condensed into that small group. 
um, we can't go into detail, but we have another thing to sh show you here, which is that the one element that escapes from a lot of the conventional restrictions I've been talking about is the wedjat eye, the healed eye of Horus, which became an amulet, which was used very widely. And that could then be given human hands. And the human hands in this case are adoring the creator god fused with the demon Bess and the child god, who is the center of that composition. So that is an emblematic form that we had right from the beginning. The full object is on the right. That's back to that Edfu scene that we saw before to bring a bit of sobriety in what we're talking about. And just the last couple of images here to emphasize the extraordinary variety of things you can do in these contexts. So what you've got here is two bands of hieroglyphs on both of those images, uh, and they give you a date. Um, and uh, this is these are cryptographic hieroglyphs. They're extremely complicated in the way you read them. So, <clears throat> and you at the same time can make hieroglyphs interact. And so you can turn them into, um, into active images. This is particularly powerful here, where you've got the god, which writes the word for a day. And then you've got the hawk, which is kind of facing the god, but it, it simply that's simply writing the word this. And then this writes perfect. So it says this perfect day. Uh, and then you've got the date following it, the same on the left. But look at how it contrasts with the hieroglyphs underneath. Here you've got conventional temple groups of three deities with small hieroglyphic captions, which is the standard form for this period. Uh, but they were very conscious that they were doing one thing rather than another. Here at Dandara, you have um, a um, some ancient document or probably a forgery put, uh, carved up on a temple wall in a crypt in a hidden place. We don't know the king's name because the cartouche is left blank. But we do know that the text was supposed to date back to Tutmosi III, 1500 years later, approximately. And in turn, the thing itself was supposed to date back much further to Pebi I in the Old Kingdom. So this writing in vertical columns here is imitating the writing style of 2000 years earlier. And this uh, the way in which hieroglyphs are used are therefore being used in all sorts of different ways to convey meanings. Um, at the same time, entire compositions are put together through the, what's written, and these are the things that do it, these pairs of columns between two scenes. <coughs> Here's a whole wall composition. And you've got the pairs of columns separating the scenes. You can also see how you've got images. I think we can work out this is the sky and the sunrise is shown at the top of, in a couple of friezes uh, at the top of the wall composition. This is how these things work in an abstract form. The king is constantly present. King, ha it, it happens to be the other way round from that uh, scene there. The king on the left, as we have it here, um, you've got the formulas that are used in these vertical columns, which have a meaning which makes sense if you put all four registers together. And then you get out of the, the problem that you don't want to put speeches in public places. So only the top register is written in the first person. And that's the only context in which a king is shown in temples speaking in the first person. And there is a photograph of the same thing. That is the wall on the left of which you saw a schematic drawing. And that is a detail on the right. And those are the, the, scene, the top register scenes where it says, I have come to you and the God says, welcome to you. And that is my final example. I'm sorry, I went very fast at the end, but I hope I've given you a sense of the extraordinary variety of what we can talk about and thank you for your patience. So thank you very much, John. Uh, is, uh, 
Immediately a number of questions. So uh, let me begin with uh, David Lurie, who asks two questions. The first one is this. You mentioned at the beginning that cursive writing was not relevant, but you also alluded at one point to retrograde orientation and inscriptions being connected to a cursive textual antecedent. With apologies if I've misunderstood. Does that mean that connection with cursive in some way militates against pictorial conventions? Um, that's a difficult question to answer. Uh, I think it probably uh, does. I think these retrograde conventions that have something to do with how you unroll a papyrus and things like that, and they are very much to do with ritual performance. Uh, you do get them used um, inscribed on walls, but basically in texts which we can assume are meant to be copies of what was present on a papyrus roll. So um, I think it would be fair to say that the hieroglyphic script on the whole does not encourage things of this sort. Uh, and therefore that exception that you have there shows you that even from an early date, people were playing at the margins between what you could do in these different contexts. Uh, when you get, you, you do get plenty of inscriptions retrograde in the pyramid texts, for example, but those are meant to be copies of papyrus originals inside pyramids. They're not really for anyone to see or read, so they're exceptions. I can always find a, an argument around these things. Sorry. <laughs> and a uh, second question by David Lorry. Uh, could you generalize a bit about the role of size? At times, large figures seem associated with pictorial representation or emblematic personification. But at other times, they seem to be fully writing with largeness indexing importance of personage or utterance. Uh, yes, well, that, that's a complicated, um, a, a complicated question. Uh, basically, what I, I was showing you quite a lot of exceptions, because the third millennium examples are much more diverse than later ones. Broadly, you'd expect there was a what we'd say intuitively was a standard scale between a depicted figure, so an image of a person, and the size of the caption, the, the scale of the hieroglyphs used to caption that figure. But uh, you have plenty of examples um, in the third millennium in particular where they were playing a lot around with those scales. If you look at the image that's still on screen, you can see, I think, that the, <clears throat> the scene of two deities with the king at the bottom, all those hieroglyphs are, I think, scaled in a normal way to the figures. But you've got a frieze band above, and that is rather larger scale hieroglyphs, and those are scaled to the building rather than being scaled to the figures. That's the sort of distinction we're talking about, I think. Uh, by the way, the frieze above is another complicated question which we'd better not treat today. <laughs> okay. Uh, uh, did I answer that enough? I hope so. <laughs> so one more question by Philip. Uh, could you briefly explain why did the royalty lose for some time the capacity for pictorial decorations? Sorry if it's a naive question. Um, it wasn't royalty, it was uh, members of the inner elite. Uh, so those tombs, uh, those uh, so-called slab stele, where you've got the figure on the left and then it's mainly hieroglyphs otherwise, uh, come from a period of just a generation or two at the same date as the Great Pyramid, roughly. And it seems that at that date, um, almost all pictorial forms were for the king and just a very small number of other people. And then the rules relaxed uh, a generation or two later. And th that also, it's a very important phase they went through where uh, in terms of architecture and the use of images, there was a detach, there was a kind of period of abstraction. And so in later periods, people reconstruct pictorial forms with slightly altered conventions. It's a whole very complicated set of developments at that date. But in later periods, yes, kings can always be shown with gods and people can't, or um, it's much more difficult until um, really about 1200 BCE that that becomes more frequent. 
hope that more or less answers. <laughs> so uh, there are hellos from Jean-Guillaume Molette Pelletier, Stephen Chrysomalis, Amalia Agnana Bessican, Miriam Bueno, Charlie Desmarais, and we also have, and many others. So. <laughs> well, thank them all very much. <laughs> the, the list goes on, uh, believe me. Uh, but so uh, I'm immediately transmitting a question by Amalia Agnana Bessican. Uh, how can you tell that the figure is the statue of the king rather than the king? Ah, um, well, the case where I showed that, the figure of the king was standing on a plinth. It wasn't uh, standing on, on the base, the, the overall baseline. And that's very often a sign that what you have is, is a statue. Uh, there are other indications. For example, if a figure is in something like a true profile, that's often an image of a statue. So I, I think we can mostly tell whether something's meant to be a statue or a figure of the king. Um, since we still have the final image on show, I should say that the base on which those two gods are sitting has a different purpose. Uh, that is there as a, a plinth on which the gods sit so that their heads are horizontal uh, in a horizontal line with the king's face. It's got nothing to do with um, any truly pictorial, uh, they're, they're, they're not thought of as being on some sort of giant plinth, although they might think that was perfectly okay. And uh, one question by Charlie Desmarais, very much in continuation to this. Uh, thank you very much for this captivating talk. According to you, would the depiction of ritual objects be rather an idealization or a transposition of real artifacts? Mm. <clears throat> well, I think there are many possibilities there. Uh, a lot of it is very highly conventionalized, um, but you do, what you get among pictures of offerings is much more commonly um, the offerings themselves than uh, than the equipment. You do get the equipment, but that's shown in quite skeletal forms. There are always exceptions. Uh, so I, th I think one would say that the ritual equipment that was used is depicted much less than you might expect. Uh, but um, we, we do have a few examples of the physical ritual equipment, and it was obviously very expensive and important, but it's reduced somewhat to a sort of um, a meaningful skeleton in lots of decoration. So then let me take the opportunity to ask a question myself. <laughs> <laughs> I'm abusing a little. Uh, so so there, there, there was all this very beautiful Chinese material also for example, the Anyang uh, oracle bones, where you see that they are filled with paint, which makes us think of uh, of UJ, of course. They have been observed by Hai Cheng Wang before. Um, but my question is this, uh, pertaining to the relation to writing and images. Um, so uh, it's very much about integration uh, in Egypt. Uh, would you say that it is much more about separation in China? Uh, more generally, in early China, more generally, how, how would you contrast the way that early Egypt and early China deal uh, with this uh, relation between writing and images? Uh, yes, I, I probably went too fast in that bit of the lecture, but I was conscious I was running late. Um, anyway, I think that what, what you seem to have is um, the, the primacy of an only semi-pictorial form of decoration. This, uh, the Tao Tian dragons and things like this, which are made into these extraordinary patterns. So pattern dominates the outsides of all the material we know. Uh, and uh, we, I think there are reasons to think that that was widespread in the general environment of palaces and places like that. It wasn't just on bronzes. And writing uh, seems to be in some way partly incompatible with that. So uh, writing was developed for use in for practical purposes in administration or whatever. And then uh, the oracle bone form of the writing is a kind of ceremonialized form of that. But you had running in parallel these emblems, as we could call them, which were um, are called 
uh, clan names in normal sinology. Uh, and those are quite strongly pictorial, but they lose their pictorial character at the end of Anyang or the very beginning of Western Zhou. And so you did have a pictorial tradition, uh, but it's, it's parallel with, and it, it actually writes words in the language. That's at least Zaudaja's argument. Um, but then that went out of use. And so you went, instead of having these more pictorial signs, you moved into having all the signs being sequences of strokes, which you had to learn, basically. And then, and then writing became much more unified. Uh, the, the other thing I was saying was how you've got extraordinary variation in the areas that writing occupy in the period if, between Western Zhou and the, the period of the Marquis of Zong, and then that disappears. Um, but uh, I think there's a, there's a bit of an incompatibility between picture and uh, and pattern decoration that you can see. So that rhino I showed uh, has no pattern on it. There are bronzes with animal form that do have pattern, so there's, it's not completely incompatible, but they're doing different things. And I think the primacy of pattern is in a way what drives the difficult relationship between writing and image, or drives one aspect of it anyway. I hope that's a useful thought anyway. <laughs> And so I thought uh, what to get go back to almost one of the very first things that you said that uh, this is all about general features of human intelligence, creativity, ingenuity, uh, reaching much further back than writing itself. One could say that between early China and early Egypt, there's uh, substantially different uh, solutions or or paths that are taken on this issue of the relation of writing to images, patterns, and so forth. Right. Yeah, yeah, I think so. Uh, but I, I think what, what I would tend to say is that in the Anyang period, uh, probably also the Huanbei period, uh, there was more compatibility between everyday writing. Uh, everyday writing is perhaps not the best way to put it, but um, ordinary writing, however you put it, and these ceremonial forms which were used for these official titles and then for some reason that disappeared. Uh, so uh, the very earliest phase of Chinese writing looks a bit more like the way Egyptian writing developed than later forms do. Uh, thank you. Is there any other questions? Um, uh, I'm just waiting a little because there's a, a slight delay. In the meantime, uh, there, there's, a, there's a number of thanks by Charlie de Marais. Thank you very much. By Jean-Guillaume Olet Pelletier. Thank you so much, Professor Baines. By Amalia Gnanadesica. Fascinating talk. Thanks, John. Well, thank them all very much for their kind words. <clears throat> Well, then, if there's a. Uh, no further question. Uh, let me myself thank you very much again, John, for accepting our invitation for this talk, uh, which we have in fact uh, enjoyed tremendously. And also many thanks to all of you who watched and interacted through the live chat. So we will meet again on Thursday, 6 of June at 10 a.m. Parisian time, so it's in four weeks' time, for a round table on a very different subject, convened by Professor Birgit Helwig from Cologne University on first language acquisition in rare languages across the world. Uh, the names of the participants will be announced on our website and social networks soon. And so see you today, uh, Thursday in four weeks' time. And thank you again.